Hi, Natalie. Good <laughs> morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks awesome. for inviting me. This is kind of exciting. I think. Yeah, super exciting. Thank you so much for being, um, for being a guest on Your Holistic Life. These are conversations in wellness because we recognize that you are not just one aspect of wellness. You're not just the vitamins you take, you know? So although this series is hosted by The Life Store, what we're trying to do here is incorporate various modalities and just create an awareness of things that are out there to help people be more well, be more healthy, Indeed. you know? Mm -hmm. So Sonia, you and I have a long history. <laughs> And many, many, many metamorphoses between us. Right? <laughs> we met um, years ago. Cough, cough, <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> uh, when we both were in the banking world. That's right. Such and a different we, world from this one, yes. And we've evolved. And here you are, licensed clinical psychologist. How did you make that jump from HR? in financial services to being licensed clinical psychologist? Well, um, it wasn't a, like a Damascus Road awakening one day. It wasn't dramatic, you know. Um, it was a very slow progression and I kind of, it's almost like changes were happening in my life and I was following in its wake in a way. Mm -hmm. But I do remember the first time I, my interest was even marginally tweaked by psychology was while I was at Citibank, I had to ask a psychologist to come in to deal with an employee who was having uh, difficulties that were manifesting in the workplace. And so I invited this, psycho this psychologist in, we were talking and how we were gonna approach um, supporting this employee. And then I just started talking to her about her and what she did. And I just remember at the end of my talk to her, talk with her, I just remember thinking, now, wow, now that's a job. Now that's a real job. You know, and I kind of felt like what I was doing was like, what am I doing? This isn't real. That's real. I just remember thinking that line, you know, that's a real job. That, and you know, that, that kind of job makes a difference to people, you know. Ah, that's, I was, I was actually going to ask, what was it that made that job real versus the amazing yeah. stuff you were doing in city? <laughs> <laughs> I guess because you could immediately see, you know, she had, it was a, was such a structured approach to dealing with someone's emotions that was going to make a difference in their life that you could see. And, you know, she was walking me through what's going to happen. She's going to do this intervention and the person is going to need this kind of support. And it was just such a concrete um, roadmap to changing somebody's life, you know? Um, and that I sparked guess, your fire. Yeah. I, you know, it was just very fascinating to me. Anyway, nothing happened for many years until I left Citibank and then we moved to Barbados. And I was bumming around the house whilst my husband was working and decided to go to audit. I became kind of bored and I went down to the UA, the campus in Barbados at Cave Hill and started auditing courses. And I said, hey, I remember that lady. Let me check out psychology. And so then I, so it was auditing for a couple of months. Then I enrolled. I liked it. I was like, okay, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the right thing. And then I enrolled and I did a diploma there of in psychology, just general psychology. And then that took, when I came home, I furthered my studies and that's the story really. And I've, very cool. it has been very, very, very um, fulfilling, very, very rewarding for me. That's awesome. Um, I love, I love how, you know, you don't have to feel trapped in your career that, you know, you were in HR for so many years and this is, I mean, they're, they're kind of close-ish. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. ish. Um, yeah. But it is a, it is a, it is a complete career switch and you're doing phenomenal and helping people, which is sure. awesome. You know, something that always um, throws me and I'm sure many of our viewers too. What's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? Okay. You know what? I think the best way to describe it is, is kind of piggybacking on what you just said, right? If you think about it, people's 
um, physiological health is inseparable from their emotional health. The two are inextricably intertwined. Okay. I think the phrase you just use, uh, did you just say a holistic approach to health, right? And so psychiatry focuses, I would say, more so on the physiological being, you know, the, the, um, the neurology of the individual and how that will manifest in certain disorders, you know, um, how different um, neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters work or don't work. And then the interventions that, that help people to cope when, you know, those systems, those physiological, biological systems aren't working right. The interventions are typically uh, medication or some pharmacological intervention. That's the gotcha. psychiatrist. And so the psychiatrist is a medical doctor um, who, has, who is specializing now in the um, neurological functioning of the body, as it were. And, and how that manifests in certain um, um, psychiatric disorders. Gotcha. 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 Okay. Um, okay. Because for, for many, for many, 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 not all, many of these disorders, there is a very real chemical biological component to it. You know, depression, anxiety, you know, for many of them, there, there are uh, physiological components that, that can be addressed. Um, the, the psychologist is more, focuses more on how does the, the um, thinking of the individual, which is influenced by lots of things, culture, um, um, environment, um, biology, in fact it's called a psychosocial uh, a, a psychobiological social approach to the individual. How do all of those things influence an individual's thinking? How does their thinking then influence their emotions? And how do the intersection of those two, their thinking and their emotions, then influence the, their behavior? Gotcha. Okay. And it's kind of using those levers, pulling those levers to get people's behavior to serve them well. Okay, because a lot of times how those, how your thinking and emotions intersects res can result in behaviors that kind of undermine your well-being. Um, and so we, we help people to understand those, the interactions between those three. And once they understand it, um, how they can then manipulate those, those three things to get the kind of outcomes that they want. Those things being their thinking, their emotions, and their behavior. Their behavior, correct. Right. So you can you can coach and guide people to some pretty significant changes, like if they For want sure. to really be their best self. Absolutely. For and sure. there comes the reward, right? From <laughs> yep. your perspective. Yep. So I get a I, lot of so I get the benefit of a lot of aha moments in my in my practice. You know, when you just <laughs> see somebody like wow didn't think i my my favorite my favorite my favorite phrase is i didn't think about it like that and usually they're feeling validated in some way like oh i'm not so broken after all and that's freedom right there yeah i'm not so broken after all that's powerful i just mm -hmm. felt that one in my emotional center mm -hmm. <laughs> i think a lot mm -hmm. of us own feeling broken you know feeling less than feeling the self-esteem and this impacts our wellness because you know emotions trigger hormones and hormones touch every cell in the body you know Absolutely. so covid and the yeah. environment that we've been existing wow. in since february march 2020 here in jamaica and for a longer time outside okay. has had some has really put people up to a different level of test like a different kind of stress um from just figuring out how does life work now you know when i have to work and my children have to school from home how do i do that when i can't or have the big one is, or the big one is when I no longer have work or when I no longer have work or I may no number one and number two or I may no longer have work yeah yeah the worry that's a big one worry. and 
now I'm spending an inordinate of time, amount of time with my spouse because we're both working from home and maybe I don't like them as much as I thought I did. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but... Well, here's the thing, Natalie. The crazy thing is thing. that... The thing, so half of my practice is adult individuals and the other half is couples, right? And how I like to say that, so a lot of couples have been saying that, I realize I don't really like this person and, and work was an escape. I didn't have to be around them, thank goodness, and now I'm trapped. And what I like to, how I like to reframe that is, you don't like the interactions you're having right now. I love that. I love that. So let's focus on that. Agreed. Let's, let's see what, let's, let's put the interactions in a Petri dish. Let's look at them and let's see how we can modify them so that you're enjoying it's satisfying being around this person again because it yeah. was so once i love that just as simple as a reframe mm -hmm. and then the work from from thereafter so um and by the way if you don't mind my saying quite often that reframe helps you to also reframe yourself too you know because you know usually there's a lot of self condemnation in that as well you know i don't like the other person but i don't like how i i am when i'm with this other person either and so there's this kind of condemnation so um that reframe is liberating for the individual themselves as well yeah. you're not your interactions you're not your behaviors you're not your thinking you do all of these these are processes that take place that that we can modify yeah yeah, yeah. You know, we're gonna. That's a great segue into a conversation about epigenetics because mm -hmm. um, epigenetics is founded on the principle and the belief that you are not your genes. So yeah, of course, I have brown eyes because genetically there were brown eyes in my family. Yeah. Right. Um, but the expression of disease is not. You're not doomed by your genes, right? Yes. And the, yes. the expression of disease, according to the study of epigenetics, is dietary lifestyle, like those factors, right? Emotional impact. I'm getting excited. Sorry. Is <laughs> massive when it comes to your epigenetic expression. You know. Yeah. Um, and you've touched on. You mentioned a few things. You mentioned anxiety. You mentioned depression. How couples interact. Um, how we worry about. Um, what's going to be happening with work and, and stress and things like that so we really wanted to touch today on you know thinking yourself well and i guess the flip side exists which is you can actually think yourself sick right well guess what i got excited as you started talking because i started to think about the surface of of i don't know a lot about epigenetics but based on the introduction you just gave, I started to think about how does that touch on my world of psychology? And I immediately went to brain, uh, brain plasticity. Do you mm -hmm. know about that? How mm -hmm. the actual structures of your brain can change depend on what you do, right? And that's freedom just again. Just gives me goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like when they discovered that, I mean, I, Natalie, let me tell you something. I think I was in my final year in my master's when they introduced it. And I, you know, imagine for two years in your master's, you're studying disorders. You know, what are the what are the symptoms of bipolar and and um, and um, uh, psychosis and you know every what we're studying everything that's wrong with an individual. And then we come upon okay, now here the people that are thriving. What's so special about them? Kind of a thing. And guess what? Brain plasticity is one of the things, and positive psychology. I'm like. This is what we should have started off with. This is exciting. Now, now we're talking. Now we're talking about health and we're talking about what the people that are healthy are doing right. And it was just, it was just a, a wonderful perspective to take rather than studying the, the world of disorder. I guess we're studying the thing, this, we're focusing now on the things that are right. And, and how, how do we replicate that instead of um, rehabilitating, in other words, disorders? You know what I mean? Yeah, man. Wow. So this, you know, let's run down this path a little. What are the people that are healthy? What are they doing right? Uh -huh, great. The people that are healthy, they are focusing on things such as positive emotions. They're able to create positive emotions such as awe. They, they, they can focus on small things and appreciate something awesome in a small, I'm at the beach, a small 
grain of sand or a rainbow or a mountain, you know, and they experience an emotion called awe, right? And you just mentioned it. That's a whole um, treasure trove of, posit- of, 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 of hormones being produced right there. I mean, you get one big vitamin boost just with that, okay? Vitamin R. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Let's bottle it, Natalie. <laughs> Sell it in the live store. Right? <laughs> um, things such as gratitude. Well, yeah. you know, we all know that, right? Being able to cultivate gratitude, being present to gratitude, right? That's okay. And there's a long list. There's curiosity, being able to um, notice things and be curious about them. Those, those are other emotions. So, so that's one of the things that they... Um, that positive psychology focuses on, you know what I mean? They're able, and because they're doing all those, they're able to, if if you imagine, and now thinking about it, if you imagine those emotions almost as levers that that you're pulling and manipulating, right? It means that they're able to then create things like healthy relationships, okay? And we're social animals. The healthier your relationships are, the healthier you're going to be as well, for instance. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep, for sure. Right? It's in, then, then we keep on going. Then that influences now your decision making, right? So in the practical world of, are you going to invest your money, or are you going to move to somewhere else, or are you going to end this relationship, or are you going to start a relationship, or uh, that you know your, your whole decision making is improved as well. You know, and Absolutely. on and on and on it goes. So you, you can see where it's touching in. In fact, if you think about it, it's touching in those three domains of thinking, feeling, doing, right? And then it's also touching on the biology, the um, social environment that you're in, and the psychology, the biopsychosocial model of psychology as well. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, it, it I has see a, a lot kind of trickle-down effect on all those different Absolutely. I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of interplay here because if you are, say for example, you're in a, a, a job that you don't like, So you've got these feelings of stuck, right? Um, And then you go home and you want to numb those feelings of stuck. So you have a few glasses of wine. Those those glasses of wine lower your inhibitions around food. And before you know it, you're eating something or you've ordered a delivery. So you're, you're gonna consume something that you would not have normally consumed that may not be what you know to be aligned with, you know, the food choices that you want to make. So therefore, you're eating yourself in a place that had you been, so not loving the job is is leading to eating habits that are not going to make you feel good and may eventually lead you down the road to obesity and even things like diabetes because you overeat. Yeah, for sure. So you can actually think and yourself. Do you, do you mind if I spread that net please. a little wider? Right. And so, so because of how you're feeling at work, right, and you come home, isn't you're going to eat in a way that's not in your interest, right? You're probably going to interact with people around you in a way that's not in your interest, and those are the interactions you're going to talk about. I don't really like this interaction again, right? And and that's almost like another branch of disorder that you're activating right there in terms of the relationships as well. So there's the eating that's, you're not, you're not making good decisions around. There's the relationships that you're not making good decisions around. And then those, how you operate in those domains feeds back now into your health. Again, yeah. and round and, and round and round it goes. Those relationships at home very often are the most important relationships in your life. They're partners. And we squander them. Children, and we, yeah. So we have a crappy day out there and then we come home and we blow up on the ones that we love the most. We come home and kick the dog kind of a thing. (laughs) The dog includes ourselves, our partner, our kids, our extended family, whatever. So I know, and I know we can't oversimplify and nothing in this conversation is meant to diagnose, prescribe, treat or anything like that. You know, you play a super valuable role and the interactions need to be one-on-one and they need to be personal. But if we could just, you know, reach out and share something with people who are kind of feeling, they're feeling the anxiety. They don't know. They've, they're, their hours at work have been cut. They're, um, they don't know if they're going to lose the job altogether. The kids are driving them bonkers. The partners are, like, 
they just feel like overwhelmed? How do they start to think themselves better? How do they start to peel away those layers so that they can shine again, you know? Yeah. Where do you start? You know what? It starts with, honestly, Natalie, a concept called self-compassion. And self-compassion is about accepting my humanness. And by that I mean accepting that I am an emotional thinking doing being. So if something tough is happening to me at work, I am gonna feel feelings of anxiety. I am going to feel feelings of inadequacy. I am going to feel all kinds of uncomfortable feelings. And it's in what makes a profound difference, a great starting point, is to be able to treat ourselves in the same way we would if somebody we cared about was suffering in the same way. So I always, it's easier like for parents, you know, think about if your kid came home from school, they'd had a horrible day, somebody had really mistreated them or they had failed at something and they come home and they're beating up on themselves, they're anxious about, are they gonna fail or are they anxious about, or, they, or they're feeling um, shamed or, all kinds of feelings, you know what I mean? How would we treat our kid? We kind of embrace them, we encourage them, we say, boy, you know, life really sucks sometimes and, 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 and I know what you're feeling is really hard, right? That's what we do with somebody that we love. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. for, for ourselves, what we do is we kind of beat up on ourselves, like, you know, we're kind of pathetic, like, get it together kind of a thing. That's what we tend to do. We can be very self-judgmental and condemnatory because we are feeling. Does that make sense? And we don't have the same kind of almost empathy for ourselves. Okay. And if you think about it, let's go back to the child. If you think about it, if that child comes home suffering because of a difficult experience and you say to that child, what the hell is wrong with you? Get up off, you know, get up, get it together. But we instinctively know that that's not going to help the child. We know that that's going to keep them stuck. We instinctively know that, right? And we understand that encouragement, Compassion, understanding will be the, um, how should I say, the scaffolding that this child can climb on to get themselves upright, facing upright again and, and hit the road again, right? And it works for us as well. If we can just change our attitude to our, our emotional experiences, Mm -hmm. you know so how do we it's kind of like that? accepting our humanity how do we do, how do, we do that okay yeah. it starts with acknowledging to yourself how difficult the situation is in right because the minute and and that's and that's a different attitude from saying what the, what's what's wrong with me okay because what's wrong with me is suggesting that the situation ain't that bad i need to be i should be over it i should i should have it all together mm -hmm. right does that make sense? Am I yep. right? And so Absolutely. the opposite is saying, hey, you know, Natalie, you are dealing with a lot right now and this is really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it starts there. Just acknowledging to yourself all of the, dif the, dif the difficulty, number one, in your circumstances, acknowledging that it's difficult. And two, acknowledging that the emotions that come out of that are difficult too. It's no fun. It's no fun being depressed. It's no fun having to cope with anxiety. That's difficult too. In the same way, you know, you, you know, help your child to say, whoa, yeah, that, you know, it's hard feeling so sad. It's hard feeling so inadequate, you know, just thinking of yourself in that way. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. then something that COVID is kind of helping us with is understanding that that um, difficulty is almost something that unites us. The truth is that, Natalie, when, we, when we're going through those kind of difficulties, right, it can be a very isolating feeling. We can kind of feel like, you know, I'm the only one failing here, especially in the world of Facebook and Instagram and so on. You can often feel like I'm the only one who just doesn't have it together here. What, what, what is wrong with me? Okay, but if you realize that, uh, you know, I was just talking to my husband this morning saying, you know, life, life is pretty messy sometimes right and we suffer as human beings every one of us have our own individual portion of pain to carry around and in a strange way suffering and pain kind of unites us that's what kind of unites us as human beings 
it's like we have a common part of our humanity mm -hmm. um then the feeling of not being so alone and so inadequate and so broken is not something is something that you're thinking away put it that way through an kind of analysis and then you do it, it's you're starting the process of not feeling so popped down and broken down and left behind um while the, the pack seems to have it all together and is racing ahead with their uh selfies and their blah 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 and, and right. their and their um their life all in order you know what i'm saying um so that's almost that's a thinking process right it's a, like a three-step thinking process one this is tough the mm -hmm. other day the other day i remember a client came in and she was you know just listing you know um talking about in in essence she was talking about how uncertain covid is you know like am i i'm never going to be able to do this again or that again and um and i'm having this anxiety what's wrong with me and i'm saying okay so you have yep this is not going right 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 right did i get that right and she said yes and i said and then we have this pandemic thing that we're dealing with right i'm like this is anxiety inducing you're working right you're supposed to be anxious about all of this hello that's how your brain works <laughs> you know what i mean and i could just see her shoulders do this hey yeah you know <laughs> you know um and yeah. so so it, it it starts there just acknowledging how difficult the situation is and how difficult the emotional reality is to deal with you know two it's um sort of being compassionate in your thinking about that you know it's yeah. three record responding to that with compassion rather than judgment and three is recognizing that that's that's part of our common humanity it doesn't isolate me i am not alone more broken than the next person no my pain connects me to natalie my pain to natalie's pain you know yeah. i'm not alone in this and and that's a sort of a thinking that you know after you go through that tomorrow you can wake up and start trying again you know yeah so it's you know you, you started off with self-compassion and accepting our humanness and then you move into saying you know this situation is really tough it's unprecedented and it's tough and you've come back to being compassionate and non-judgmental and we tend to think of the good type of being non-judgmental that i won't judge you but what you just hit on is that in being non-judgmental i should not judge me as well I always laugh natalie you know when you hear them saying the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you and i'm thinking hello if we could do unto ourselves the way we often do unto others, we'd be way ahead of the game. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. So after we've kind of cleared ourselves and we're feeling more compassionate, I still might be feeling kind of sad. You know, how do I, how do I then bring about better feelings of well-being? Mm -hmm. Perk myself up like how do i yeah. change the channel i mean i have i personally have my coping techniques i have my mechanisms yeah. but what do you yeah. normally recommend to your clients well the first thing that i try to do is reframe sadness right um a lot of times our perspective on the emotion of sadness is a kind of toxic one that sadness in and of itself is a bad thing okay but sadness is an emotion that's activated by the brain by the emotional centers of the brain and you're feeling sad for a reason and so what i up and 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 natalie whatever efforts we if our objective in what we do is about avoiding difficult emotions or stopping difficult emotions that's going to be typically toxic behavior right you talked about coming home and feeling frustrated and fearful right and because i don't want to feel that because those are negative feelings and i don't want to feel that gluck, 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 gluck. And I, right and that's not so our response to the emotion is is um is not healthy so mm -hmm. it starts with being able to be with that emotion as a human accepting that emotion as a human um processing of what i'm going through that's what it is accept the messy accept the uncomfortable yeah yeah Just don't that's part of the self there <laughs> yes that's part of the self-compassion you know what i mean that's part of self-compassion accepting that being sad is a part of my humanness and it's difficult to be sad but that but that 
that's a part of all of this. Yeah. That's how human beings navigate through the world. When sad things happen, I feel sad. When difficult things happen, when scary things happen, I feel fearful. When anxiety-inducing things happen, I feel anxiety. Quite often, it's our response to those emotions that is um, maladaptive. So when people are feeling sad, I help them to be with that sadness, to figure out, well, what's this sadness about? And problem solve around what the sadness is about. The sadness is what? I've made a mess of my relationship or I've, I've, I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job tomorrow. This problem solve around not having the job tomorrow and not, and not try to fix the sadness. You're working correctly if you're feeling sad. Action. I often or, find action. You, you said, yes. you know, what's the action, the problem solving around that. I often find that action helps. Exactly. Um, but I think what's, what's, what's challenging, Natalie, is to figure out to what do you direct your action? Right. Right? Oftentimes we direct our action at fixing the emotional being that we are. And I often say that's like trying to fix, stop the blood flowing in your veins. Right. <laughs> You'll be just as both as successful, yeah. right? And that's where the self-judgment comes in again. Quite often, because we're sad, we're judging that and think, 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 and figuring out, trying to figure out how to stop that sad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Anytime happiness in and of itself becomes the objective, you, you're probably not going to get it. I get you. I get you. It's about it's about living your life in a in a in a healthy, wholesome, pursuing what's important to you, pursuing your values, and then guess what? Happiness is an offshoot of that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to share a bit of a personal story um, surrounding sadness that just came up recently for me. In that, one of my best friends died unexpectedly. Um, she did not have COVID. She's two years older than me and a fitness instructor, an amazing human being. And she just died. And my world fell apart. Like I literally fell to my knees the Saturday morning when I got the news. And I said, okay, I'm going to allow myself the weekend. I'm just going to leave the store. I'm going to go home. I'm just going to do whatever my body feels like doing as I start to mourn. But I'm giving myself till Monday morning. I'm going to be up and I'm going to be back at it. Well, Monday morning, I was not up and back at it. Now, this person who passed is a member of a community, of the spinning community. And she had, she was such a beacon of light on the world that she had like, just a community of people who just absolutely loved her and we came together and the closest of us came together and formed a whatsapp group because we're all over the world and there's covid right so we can't go we can't be with but we found ways to be with virtually and her funeral eventually happened on the friday so that's like not even a week after she passed and we all participated in the funeral. It was a spinning ride and then tributes on the beach because she lived in Bali. And by the end of that, it was like at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> by the end of that, I felt, okay, I think I'm okay now. And then I decided it was time to go to sleep and I closed my eyes and I honestly felt a presence of her say, it is okay now. So. I say all of that, like I share all of that to say that I just, I just gave it over. Like I knew it wouldn't last forever. I knew that my, my compass doesn't stay down for long, but I needed more than the weekend to, and it's still, I get emotional when I think about her, when I talk about her, but I'm, I'm now functional, you know, whereas <laughs> that week I was not so functional. Um, I'm sorry for your loss though, Nadia. Yeah. Well, that's, that's these things one of the hardest things. Yeah, yeah. But you're um, bringing in community, doing, um, bringing in things that bring back the joy, um, honoring, in this situation, honoring memories, you know. Um, something that whenever I start to feel a little difficulty in any sort of emotion, I edit what I listen to. I edit the inputs 
and I make sure that just like, you know, like if Fame FM is playing a song you don't like, you switch over to Fire or you go check out what's going on on, on Irie, yeah? Yes, yeah. We can change our channel yes. based on dialing into a particular frequency. What do you think about something like that as a concept for helping you lift your, ease your anxiety, ease your depression, lift your spirits? What do you think about something like that? Um, well, what you're kind of touching on is this concept of something that I call diffusion, right? So the brain processes, how the brain, here's the easiest way I think about it. When you think about the brain as an organ in your body, okay? okay. Just like your lung, right? What your lung does is it, what does it do again? I think it produces carbon dioxide, in oxygen and produces carbon dioxide. That's what it does. You know, if you think about it as a machine, what your brain and its, its job is to get oxygen into your blood. Okay, your brain has a job now to kind of protect you. And how it does that is it produces thoughts. Okay, all right. And so that's, so think about it that way. Now, when you have certain experiences though, some of your thoughts can become extremely conservative. So when I fail at something, I start thinking that's something that logs in my, that's a, that's a, let's call it a data point. I failed, right? Mm -hmm. Relationship, exam, whatever. Okay. And then how our brain works is by connecting data points. So when I come upon a new challenge, guess what? That data point is activated. I failed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Trigger. And right, right, exactly. Right. And we, and then we start the, the kind of network of thoughts. The brain just starts producing all sorts of other thoughts as well, because it's very, the brain is very conservative, more conservative. Right. And it's always going to say, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that kind of a thing. Remember you failed at it before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, I'm equating that to the one channel of, in, you know, one station. So that might be fame FM. You failed, you failed. Don't forget you failed, you failed. You, okay. That might be one channel. Okay. And what I help individuals to do is to kind of diffuse from thoughts that aren't going to help them. So if I know that I'm about to embark on something really challenging and risky, I know that the channel that went play the loudest in my brain is the um, fame FM. And it's the one that says, you failed, you failed, you failed, you failed, you failed, because that's the data points that are connecting. So I try to help them diffuse from that and say, okay, it's just a thought. I don't have to hitch my wagon to that particular thought. The radio might be playing, but the radio on the table over there. So the radio now tie me down now, nothing. I can keep on doing what I want. Let the radio play, right? But also because Natalie it's easier to start doing something than stop doing something. That's how human beings are, right? So let the radio go on play. Don't try switch off the radio but add something like okay um yeah i know the rate and that's acceptance again accepting that part of my humanity is that on the threshold of risk that is a radio that going to start playing right. if i can reduce it to a radio not my and not not my master not the one thing that's dictating what i do it's a radio playing Okay, then mm -hmm. I can decide, okay, that radio is playing, but what's my action going to be about? My action is going to be about, guess what? This relationship is really important to me, or this um, exam is really important to me. So my actions are going to be about that, not necessarily the radio. Let the radio go on play. I really can. But I also have another manifesto as it is. It is that I really want to develop myself. So I'm going to take a moment right now and... I have five more minutes. I'm going to read. I'm going to do something. My actions are going to be about what I want for my life, not about what Fame FM happens to be playing in the background. Yeah. I'm not dedicating any energy to switching it off or, uh, or shutting it down or so on. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it plays. It's part of my human nature. It's going to play. I know what it is, you know. Um, and... But, but what's more important to me is, is barreling ahead. Let me give you an, an example. My personal mm -hmm. example is that, like when you ask me to do an interview with you, right? Um, and I do this all the time. So you think, hey, piece of cake. No, never, ever, ever do I get asked 
to do an interview or to appear publicly or anything like that. And I don't feel anxiety, not <laughs> tie in my stomach. And it's like, oh, whoo, there it is kind of thing. You know what I mean? I know it's going to come. Hey, yeah. we're good friends. It's going to come. But it's, that's not what's most important. That's my brain just saying, oh, be careful. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Remember, you didn't do so good one time here. <laughs> Right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, go, go on playing, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is important. And I keep going. So it's almost like I take, I take the radio along with me if it wants to come for a ride or not. The point is I, I kind of not give it the importance. I free myself from feeling that I have to act on that particular mm -hmm. um, set of thoughts that my brain happens to be producing in that moment. Yeah, yeah. What about this concept of... Um putting different thoughts in. So listening to or creating affirmations or listening to affirmations or listening to those motivational things. You know, the ones I'm talking about, they're all over YouTube. You can do this, get up, you warrior, you. And it's just all sorts of exciting hype. How does that play into Here's the what thing. I talking. think what's important is your attitude towards it. If it's not, if you're not using where people can end up really falling on their faces and hurting themselves is where they're trying to shout out, out shout the, the thoughts of doubt or replace them necessarily. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, I think you have a better choice at, because in a way you're kind of condemning yourself. It's like, because most people are trying to out shout it. They're like, I hate that part of me kind of a thing. You know, I hate that I doubt myself. I hate that I don't trust people, right? And that's the judgment part that I'm talking about. Acceptance really is a very, it percolates into a lot of, right? It's accepting that your brain is going to do that. Yeah. Okay. And so, but, but what I want to, what do I want my action to be about? I want my action to be about this particular affirmation. Okay. So whilst my brain is playing the, I can't, I'm not good enough playing, uh, you know, they, they, nobody likes me. The, your brain is going to play that. Let it play. But what do I want my action to be about? My action is going to be about, I'm a warrior who really wants to finish this marathon. So let me put one more foot in front of the other. Let me put, okay, and let me, let me follow that um, station. Let me follow that affirmation in what I now do, my actions. Okay, so if, if as long as it's as long as it's not about denying or condemning yourself for those thoughts that are so painful and those emotions that are so painful and, and then you're cussing yourself for having them. That's the kind of judgment that I'm talking about, which is often what people do. You know, people talk about well, you should be more self-confident, like it's like it's a pill that you take. Yeah, yeah. You Just know? turn it on. <laughs> yes, you know, it doesn't work like that. You should love yourself, you should be more gentle with yourself so that you can then pick yourself up. Right, you know? right, right, right. Makes a I, lot I, of I sense. Does it? Okay. Sure. Yeah, man. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So these, these things play a role, but not oh, to the one, Sorry, Natalie. One thing I, just, I do want to just mention too. A lot of times too, the affirmations can be about, um, as I said, people, you, you know, affirmations can sometimes be about you should not feel inadequate. There's no place for that here. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You should not feel depressed. And now those are emotions we cannot switch off. At the switch. There's no switch to switch right. them off. Right. And the thing is that the okay. brain doesn't recognize negatives. So when you say you should not feel depressed, you have to process depressed first before you process the not. Exactly. So, yeah. It's one of, the, exactly. one, of the, one of the presuppositions of NLP, I think, even, um, to say things out the way you want them. So don't say, <laughs> here we go, don't say. <laughs> say it the so way you want it. Exactly, exactly. Say it the way you want it. So. You, if you don't mind, I always bring it back to my favorite topic, which is couples. I'm so sorry. But yeah, the yeah. truth is, so a lot of times I, when I'm talking to couples, for instance, you know, I'll say to them, you know, when something goes wrong in your relationship, you end up beating up on the person for what they haven't done and they haven't done and you're cussing for what they haven't done and you still don't say what you need yet. The time you're there cussing them that they never did this or they, or, or they did that. Why don't you just tell them what you need? Right? Yeah. You know, tell them, you know, 
you know, I came, I come home and you ignore me. You don't, you talk on your phone and you condemn And all the person going to be is defensive. Right, and all know you know, tell them what you want. You don't, you're, you're a cost from top to the, honey. Right. Yeah, just say, hey, I just came home. Can you please hug me? Yeah, that's saying what you want, that's saying it the way you want it to be. Right, the person don't have to be defensive if that's what you're gonna do. Right, yeah, and that's that taps into the, the, the notion of expressing a positive need, saying what you want the person to start doing rather than telling them what you want them to stop doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I can bring it back around to um, thinking. what we started. Yeah, thinking yourself well. And you mentioned some really positive emotions that you want to bring in the experience into your body. And you mentioned awe, gratitude, and curiosity. These mm -hmm. are, if I could bring it all the way back, these are three emotions of many that you're suggesting that we cultivate in ourselves. So taking a moment to watch a sunrise and going, oh, isn't that beautiful? Or taking a moment to watch a butterfly and wonder where is it going to go next? Which flower is it going to go next? And it sounds kind of hokey. Really checking it out. Checking yeah. it out. All the details. Sometimes, I, I'll be honest with you, Natalie, my, I, my attention is not as long as I'd like it to be. Yeah. <laughs> So I do certain, I add certain tools to help me to do that. And one of the things I do when I want to be mindful of something is to count. So I will look at a butterfly and count the different details that I can notice. Wow. Hey, one wing is slightly bigger than the other. Well, what do you know? Hey, the blue, blue spot too. The blue spot over here is more oval and over here on this wing, it's that way. And oh. Wait a minute, and the yellow, it matches the petal that it's on. Whoa, and four. So it's really being present as much as you can to things around you. You know, activating your five senses, what you can see, hear, taste, touch, smell, and listening, bringing in, paying attention. Bringing in these, bringing in, that's, that's really good because <laughs> you get to slow down because you and I are both very fast paced people. <laughs> But bringing in these positive emotions is going to trigger the hormonal cascade that goes with positive emotions. It's going to trigger the neurotransmitters. So these become almost self-perpetuating. And over time, when you, when you um, encourage them in yourself, then they start to come more naturally. And then you're, before you know it, you're elevating your spirits. and these emotions and modify, of, modifying your body chemistry you know that's exactly where i was going because your oh. emotions <laughs> have yeah they have um like physical manifestations exactly exactly an expression and expression in disease exactly and i mean where it's exactly where you started off you know if you if you um having one certain kind of experience and thinking about it in a certain way then you're triggering the stress inducing hormones right um and our body does that very naturally. At the, as, as you say, who that? Whoops! We get a nice little dose of adrenaline right there. We just need to hear a door slam. You know what I mean? We just need to turn on CNN for 30 seconds. Whoa! One big dose of cortisol right there. Kind of a thing, right? We do it, we do it at the drop of a hat. And so what we're talking about now is cultivating the... Um, a, a similar a response, a, a counter to that, an antidote. We're cultivating that by all trying to always be present so that we can um, seize moments to create these positive emotions. You know what I mean? Yeah. And within that sphere of creating the positive emotions so that we're creating a positive environment in our body, recognizing that things are going to happen that are going to derail us. Right. Somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to lose a job. Something stressful is going to happen. A taxi man going to rear in you. Like, <laughs> and, but it's and not... oftentimes on the same day. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what is it about that energy? <laughs> Um, so it's not to fear those one-off things. So we experience it, we allow it to happen, we're compassionate about the fact that life gets messy and this happens and I felt this way about it, but we do what we need to do to pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off with compassion and, and try again and try again. For sure, for sure. Yeah.
Yeah. And a wonderful thing that I love to, to help my clients with is just helping them to speak the language of emotions. You know, if I'm sad about something, um, so let me tell you, for instance, so it, I'm, I'm just elaborating on the fact how important it is to be with your emotions, to, 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 to um, and make space for them, for your emotions, you know? So for instance, if, a lot of times, if you think about people who are severely depressed, right? A lot of times their they, the life has no meaning for them. And I'll often say, well, if you're feeling really sad that life doesn't have any meaning, what is the sadness telling you that's important to you? Light bulb, okay, I need meaning in my life. Yep, that's what the sadness is trying to tell you. That's how your Action. brain works. Yeah. Action. Yeah. Let's go find some meaning. That's what we're problem solving around, not the sadness. You know, sadness this is a, has a purpose. Yeah, exactly. It serves a purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it has this is to point you in the right direction kind of a thing, you know? This is a whole conversation, making space for your emotions. And I think, I'm going to generalize here, but I think women are doing an okay job kind of getting there. Some, some, I think our men still, they still don't feel that it's okay to be with their emotions. You know, I was, I was talking with someone yesterday about something and you can tell that it's something that they're super passionate about and they hadn't put much, I don't know, maybe they hadn't made the strides necessary to realize this dream. And the conversation that we were having was making them realize that they could realize the dream. And they looked away and I saw tears in their eyes. And I said, what is it? And they said, no, 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 it's okay. Shut it down. I'm feeling an emotion. <laughs> Shut it down. But when we bottle those things up, you know, so I think men, if you've watched all the way to the end of this interview, men need to realize that it's okay to express emotion. And the bottling up of those emotions bottles up the hormones, bottles up the neurotransmitter and starts that whole situation in the body that makes disease easier to take hold. It's not yeah, a positive. And not to mention, you, you, it's, look, it's not going to go away, number one, and it's going to come up. And when it comes up, that's when you have little or no control over your behavior. Yeah. When you don't press it, press it, press it, press it, press it, press it down, compact it down as much as possible, it's going to come out one day. And when it blows, you're not going to have a lot of control. You're, you're not going <laughs> to, probably not going to get the outcomes you want. Yeah. 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 Wow. This has been awesome. Um, tea house therapy. That is such a beautiful name. <laughs> It makes me think of curling up on a couch talking to a good friend. This is the name of your practice. It is, it is. And I have a great coach. You I do? Had a client. Yes, I had a client once. She would come to me on a Thursday and she was so wonderful. On Thursday morning, she would put on her Twitter, it's coach day today and there's a picture of my coach. <laughs> so I have a great, big, huge, soft, comfy coach and lots of teas all over the place. You name it, I have it. Um, in terms of teas and people come a couple of times they drink they're drinking coffee too but that's okay <laughs> and um but yes it's about a conversation to just kind of help you figure out what 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 road you want to be on are you on it and how can we get you right on it again and you know yeah, yeah. we need i think fulfilled. i think more people need that that unbiased compassionate ear that has knowledge that can kind of ask the tough questions and make you have those reframing aha moments. <laughs> I love so, those. <laughs> Sonia, love this those. has been awesome. How do people find you? Are you okay. on social media? Do you have a website? Yes, I have a website. It's soniawinterassociates.com and you can get to me through my website. Okay. Are you on Instagram then, too? Uh, yes, I am. I am on IG. It's T House, T House Therapy. I have a Facebook therapy. page as well. You can find me at T House Therapy. Awesome, awesome. Well, Sonia, thank yeah. you so much for your time. Valuable. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. My <laughs> favorite topic. My favorite. I'll go on and on. So I mean, raining in. So thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. I appreciate your time and effort and continue doing the amazing work that you're doing because there's no shortage so of people that need support. Yeah. 
Well, and another great thing about COVID, I will say that people are more open about getting this kind of support now. That's you know, so it's real. COVID has kind of pulled down our guard about mental health. And that's great, you know, um, it's created a space for more people to feel okay. Yeah. To yeah. come and to come and get therapy. So I can imagine. I can imagine. Tell you what, we're gonna do this again, and we're gonna talk couples next time. Straight Yay! couples, since that seems to be something that you love. Yes, <laughs> yes please. All right. Peace and love. Take care, Natalie. Bye bye. Now.